Good evening, everyone. I suppose everyone can hear me well. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to the seventh program in the Cooperberg Center um, NEH sponsored colloquia, which was organized this year in response to the global refugee crisis. My name is Mirna Lekic, and I'm an assistant professor of music here at Queensboro. Um, I've been working on this series this year with my uh, two colleagues from the English department, Kat Alves, who I see there, and Aliza Atik. All right. <laughs> and Dan Leshen and Marissa Hollywood Berman of the Cooperberg Center, who I hope are here as well tonight. Um, tonight's program is going to continue our transgenerational and multidisciplinary exploration of the themes of exile, displacement, mass violence, and genocide. Um, and we will be doing so through related musical compositions. Um, before I begin, I would like to ask you to silence your phones and also to hold your applause until the end of each segment. Um, I will speak before each one of it. Um, we open with a selection of exile-inspired songs that span some 200 years. So please join me welcoming our faculty members of Prime and Jennifer Clear.
And decades later, when the Nazis banned the performance of Chopin's music during their occupation of Poland. Chopin died at the age of 39. Um, at his request, his heart was, many years later, taken back to Poland.
Ensemble 365, whose members um, are Sarah, soprano Sarah Parr, cellist Marta Bertoska Riley, uh, violinist Karen Rostra, and myself. Um, and we premiered the next piece in February of last year. Um, Aramesh is a work in four movements set to Persian poetry about exile. Um, and when planning this event, we made sure to include works by living composers. I had hoped that the composer, Ramin Hedarbeki, would be here tonight. Is he? I guess not. So I'm going to read a little bit about uh, the meaning of the poetry, because we do not have a tr translation. This is what Ramin had written for me a while ago. Um, can we have the slide with the... Thank you. All right. So we have the first poem, uh, which translates to atop his boat. And this poem describes the dilemma of the boatman, the struggles in the middle of the ocean, and the unease of being on shore. In that regard, the poem's commentary is on wanting to be in and away from places with a sense of belonging. The second song is based on a very short poem um, which translates to what would I have done if there were no trees? And the poem explores the absence of the tranquility that nature provides. The third poem, Rumination of a Tree, um, reflects the speaker's alienation from her like, which is ironically caused by shared language, music sound, and supposed kinship. The three wishes to replace those, the tree, I'm sorry, wishes to replace those seemingly close to it with passers-by who long for taking momentary refuge in its shade. And the last poem questions why we bring calamities upon ourselves. The poem comes to an end when the poet acknowledges that in absence of an answer, the silence is as destructive as our own actions. So please join me in welcoming members of Ensemble 365.
2017 marks the 75th anniversary since the internment of Japanese Americans in the United States. Um, and our next set is dedicated to the music that was played in these camps, including jazz. So I'm going to invite to the stage uh, Professor Scott Whitrop and members of the Queensboro Jazz Ensemble who will perform the next segment. <coughs> So while we're setting up for, uh, for our performance, I just have a few words I'd like to say. Um, some background on uh, the Japanese internment camps, a uh, background of the history, and uh, how this ties into the performance that you'll hear from us. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States, gave the following statement to the American people in what would be a portent of tumultuous events in this nation's history. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. We will gain the inevitable triumph. The bombing of the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, with an aftermath of over 2,000 deaths, 1,000 wounded, and the sinking of 18 vessels, forced the United States to enter the already escalating events of World War II. The domestic reaction to the attack, while largely focused on mobilizing war efforts, also included an extreme response by the federal government to growing racist sentiment against Americans of Japanese descent and Japanese American immigrants who were fast becoming the unfortunate and undeserved targets of a formal campaign to preemptively place blame for undermining the American war effort, charged only with the crime of being ancestrally related to those who carried out the attack. The legislation known as Executive Order 9066 authorized the U.S. military to designate any civilian areas in the continental United States as military areas. February 2, 1942, the date of the signing of this order, 
is the date which also lives in infamy as the day the United States allowed in modern times for members of its population to become unfree within this free nation as the order provided the U.S. military with rationale for displacing between 110 and 120,000 Japanese Americans from their homes to be forcibly incarcerated in government-built camps under the suspicion that they might subvert American war efforts. Over 60% of those displaced were born in the U.S. and the remainder had immigrated legally. On the uh, next slide is a brief timeline of events. Uh, neglectful conditions within the camps reflected the depressed and desperate sentiment among those wrongfully incarcerated. Situated throughout a dozen remote locations in the Western United States, this dire circumstance was often described among the displaced using the Japanese expression, shikata ganai, which means nothing can be done. A phrase also carrying an additional meaning of maintaining one's dignity in the face of unseeming, uh, insurmountable odds. Constructed of cheap materials and often without basic amenities such as working plumbing, entire families were forced to live in single room cramped quarters. Preventable illnesses such as food poisoning, typhoid, smallpox, and dysentery persisted in part because of the understaffed and inadequate medical care. The 30,000 children among the displaced families attended woefully underfunded schools taught by other displaced Americans for very low wages and without adequate supplies. Only those subjects approved by regulatory agencies were taught and mostly comprised of subjects deemed worthy of what was known as the democratic ideal, discouraging the use of Japanese language among children. Despite these and other hardships, displaced Japanese Americans often found a sense of strength through, uh, through community, manifested in the formation of social clubs that promoted visual and performing arts. Through jazz, which was an American popular genre approved by government agencies as intended as, quote, Americanization of displaced, jazz and other genres were already widely popular among Japanese Americans. Musical instruments, though often of poor quality, were provided to those who desired to perform. Engaging in dance parties became a common occurrence and was later cited by survivors as one of the few pleasures afforded to them during this difficult time. It may seem surprising then that traditional Japanese musical culture thrived among these social clubs. The teaching and performing of traditional music, dance, and culture alongside the availability of American popular culture served as a poignant reminder that within the internment camps, an entire population had been forced to exist simultaneously between two worlds at once while being deprived of both. The following performance represents some of the music that may have been heard in the internment camps. Music provided a catharsis from the struggle to survive in a senseless situation. Music also helped Japanese Americans robbed of their rights to maintain cohesive community and persevere through a time of great hardship. We thank you for the opportunity to participate in tonight's event, and we hope you enjoy the performance. Thank you.
trio that we are going to perform next um, was composed in 1944, and it was written as a lament, both for Shostakovich's good friend, composer named Ivan Solertinsky, who passed away that year, and also for the victims of the Holocaust around the time that the news of concentration camps was reaching Russia. Uh, this trio is set in four movements, and the final allegro, which we are playing tonight, um, features themes from the previous three. You will hear an impassioned, anguished dance that uses elements of Jewish folk music. The piece was first played in St. Petersburg in 1944, and it had its Moscow premiere in November of that year, which was the college himself at the piano. Um, this is how the event was described by the violinist Rostislav Dubinsky.
to the final piece um, on the program tonight. And this piece is also a piano trio, which features tape or pre-recorded sound, because tapes, you know, are kind of old-fashioned. Um, it was commissioned by the series and the NEH grant, um, and we had asked composer Andre Bergeshire, who is a faculty member here, um, to create a work that incorporates material from the Stonehill archive of Jewish melodies that were brought to the US by Holocaust refugees. Um, this piece was to demonstrate how real world artifacts that survive genocides through refugees can live on in a new creative work and honor the memory of the victims. So Andre is here tonight. He has been helping me with the slides. Uh, and, I, and I would like to invite him to say a few words about the piece. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Kerper Holocaust Center, who entrusted me for this commission, as well as the National Endowment for the Humanities, whose support made this project possible, not just this piece, but the, the entire colloquia. Um, so as Dr. Lakic just uh, eloquently described, uh, I was asked to use, uh, to write a piano trio using material from the Stonehill Archive, which is a collection of recordings from Holocaust survivors made in 1948 in, uh, in New York City, I believe, by a man called Ben Stonehill. Uh, there are about 1,000 of these, these recordings, um, so in the entire memory of a culture that was almost destroyed. Um, and some of them are available online. They are trying to make more of them available. Right now, I think it's only about 60 of them. Um, so the song I chose is called uh, Traveling the Dort, which means, uh, which is Yiddish for traveling, ca traveling cat is there, and of course refers to one of the main uh, extermination camp um, of the Nazis called Treblinka, um, which was located very near Warsaw in, uh, in, in Poland. Uh, the song was uh, written by Jewish inhabitants of the ghetto, of the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw around 1942, uh, when they started to learn um, the truth about what happened to, to people who had been taken to the truth about the extermination camps. Uh, so the text of the song is very um, touching, and the melody is also quite beautiful. So unlike the, the melody used by Shostakovich, who is clearly has this Eastern, Central European, Ashkenazi flavor, uh, the melody of the song that I use is actually borrowed from a popular tango uh, song. So it's an Argentinian tango that made its way, its way to, uh, to, uh, to Poland. Um, yeah, so I, my piece is in five movements, five short movements, and I use the song in two different ways. Uh, first it comes an instrumental version in the, in the third movement, uh, and then it appears also at the end in a different way, but I don't want to reveal too much. Uh, the piece is for piano trio and tape. So tape means uh, means that my piece uses pre-recorded sounds. So of course today we don't use magnetic tapes anymore, but composers starting to use recorded sounds, uh, starting to use recorded sounds in their music around the 50, 1950s, 1960s, and at the time we use magnetic tapes, which is why uh, we, we still use the term tape as a tradition, but obviously we're not using tape anymore. Anyway, that's, uh, that's enough of me, and I will leave you with the excellent Song of 365, and thank you so much for premiering this piece. This is the first time this piece will ever happen, ever. So. <laughs>
that tonight's program was a reminder that the very act of listening to music invites us to mediate between ourselves and the other. While the music can provide us as listeners, composers, and performers with some relief and refuge, it is also an agent in moving us beyond abstract compassion. To this end, we have compiled a list of resources which are included in your programs that can help you direct, uh, that can help direct you in taking some positive action and making your voice heard. As we end tonight's program, our thanks go to our performers, composers, our wonderful technical and recording crew, thank you, uh, my colleagues, especially Aliza, Kat, Dan, and Marissa, our Queensboro community and its president, Dr. Diane Cole, and Susan Aiken of the Queensboro Performing Arts Center, who helped uh, make this space available to us. We are also grateful to all the faculty and our students who participated in this series, and all of you who joined us tonight. So thank you.